Welcome to, or welcome back to, this Radio Design 101 episode covering impedance matching. This is part two of a two-part sequence on impedance matching, and you can watch this on its own, or you can go back and watch part one first. Your choice. In this particular part, we're going to look at various circuit topologies for doing matching. And we're also going to look at a series of schematics to see how these are used in real-world applications. In part one, we looked at how to design matching networks at the input and output of a low noise amplifier, and we went into some depth on the equations used. So both of the matching networks that we used in that example were what are called L-type matching networks, but there are many other matching networks as well. In addition to that, both of those networks we started with a higher impedance and we matched to a lower impedance. In general, these networks work in both directions, so if you do it in one direction, then it works in the other. But let's take explicitly a look at converting from a low impedance to a high impedance. These two amplifiers are composed of two transistors in what's called a cascode configuration. And the distinguishing feature relative to the common base that we looked at previously is that the input has a high impedance. There's also some capacitance associated with it. This is a MOSFET version of the same thing. It has two transistors in a single case. It's called a dual gate MOSFET, but it essentially implements a cascode design. So how do we convert from a low to a high impedance? Well, remember, matching networks work in either direction. So in this case, all we did is we took the L network and we turned it around. So it's the same as before, except the series and parallel sides are reversed. In addition to that, we've swapped the capacitor and inductor locations. In order to design this, we just do what we did before and adjust the formulas as appropriate for the CL swap. The input impedance to one of those cascode amps is typically high, like 5K in this example, but it also has some capacitance associated with it. And the reason that we swapped the C and the L is because of that input capacitance. Once we calculate what the matching network capacitance needs to be, we can just subtract off the CN value from that so that the net result of these two that are essentially in parallel will be what's needed for the match to a resistive 5K. Now here's the classic way to match from a low source impedance such as 50 up to a much higher impedance in this example 5K. We can use a transformer, and this has been done for over 100 years. The transformer in this case consists of two air-wound inductors that are on the same core or at least near each other, and they have a coupling coefficient of K. One side of the transformer has a capacitor on it forming an LC bandpass filter circuit or resonator. That allows one to do a turns ratio transformation from some low voltage here to a higher voltage here without perfect coupling. So the design procedure for this particular circuit is to resonate the L and the C. In this case, the resonant circuit is on the secondary side or the right side. So we resonate L2 with C, accounting for Cn as needed. That forms a bandpass filter if we know what the R value is. So we can use what we learned in episode one to design that bandpass filter on the right side. After you know how many turns you need for L2, you can estimate the number of turns needed for the primary side L1 from these formulas. Now there's a very important thing associated with matching networks we haven't talked about, and that is that whenever you have an impedance transformation, you also have a voltage transformation. That can be shown from power conservation and looking at the voltages and currents on the two different sides. But here we've just captured it in a final formula at the bottom, which says that the voltage ratio V2 over V1 is the square root of the impedance ratio. And this is generally true of any matching network, not just ones based on transformers. So given that relationship between voltage transformation and impedance transformation, Let's look at one other matching network. This is actually one of my favorite designs because it's very easy to do. 
What you do is create an LC resonant circuit like before. The inductor is here and it has a reactance X0 at the resonant frequency you're planning for. It resonates with the series combination of these two capacitors in this example. The two capacitors here form a lossless voltage divider so that V2, we'll call that the output, is smaller than V1. And we can use the previous formula to determine what that means in terms of the ratio of R2 to R1 during the impedance match. To be a resonator, X1 in series with X2, or the net, which is X1 plus X2, needs to be equal to X0, as shown here. Once we know what that total is, we can use the voltage divider equation and the relationship we talked about between voltage and impedance transformation with these formulas to solve for the independent x1 and x2 values using algebra. And this network generally works quite well, provided you shoot for a quality factor Q around 3 or 5 or more. Finally, let's look at a few additional options. Common ones are Pi networks, T networks, LL networks, and this is an outlier we'll talk about at the end. Let's look at the Pi network. The Pi network can be interpreted as two back-to-back -back L networks. The way we do that is we consider X2 here to be a series combination of two elements, X2A and X2B. And then on the left, we'll have an L network with X0 and X2A, and on the right, we'll have X1 and X2B. And that will match from some high impedance down to an internal low impedance and then back up to a high impedance. Why would you want to do this? Well, it will give you a more narrow bandwidth, for example. Another network that's very similar is the T network, the name obviously from the shape. And here we take X2 and consider it as being composed of two parallel elements X2A and X2B. And then you have an L network on the left and an L network on the right, and we match from something low impedance up to something higher impedance in the center, and then back down to something lower impedance. Now the R1 and R2 don't have to be the same. You don't have to match up and then back down to the same value. So these networks generally allow you to match to anything. And these T networks are used in antenna tuners a lot. We have a nano VNA video that shows a MFJ antenna tuner and the schematic inside, and that's a T network. LL networks are useful when you want to achieve wider bandwidths in your match. So you match from some R1 up to something a little bit higher, and then up to something higher still. When you do that, the elements that you get here end up having lower Q in the design and the bandwidth is broader. Finally, microstrip is used at very high frequencies. Microstrip matching networks are beyond the scope of this particular video for sure, but I did want to mention them because at very high frequencies, things necessarily end up being transmission lines and you have to deal with that. But this is generally reserved for microwave design things in the several gigahertz frequency region. Okay, that brings us to what I think is the most fun thing in the whole presentation, and that's looking at some real-world example schematics. I have five different example schematics for us to look at, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but I would encourage you to hit the pause button and look at them and try to understand them in the context of the material that we've just covered. I'm going to start with the simple crystal radio. This is one of the earliest types of radios that was ever used back in the early 1900s. If you look at the schematic on the right, you can see immediately that there's a voltage step up due to an air wound transformer. The left hand side is fed from an antenna, which is probably 50 ohms or less, and the right hand side is a little complicated, but it goes through a crystal, otherwise known as a diode that rectifies the signal and converts it to audio and then into headphones shown here as 1k ohms. So we're stepping up from a low impedance to a high impedance as we step up from a lower voltage to a higher voltage. 
Remember the signals are weak, therefore that voltage step up is very useful. But we can't step up too much because we have to worry about the load over here. We have to try to get as much signal from the antenna as possible into the load. Now the actual analysis of this circuit is quite complicated, but we have the tools at this point to figure out roughly what's going on. First thing I need to mention is that this is a 50-foot antenna and this radio design is for stuff in the 1 megahertz range. For example, the AM broadcast band. So this antenna is considerably shorter than a quarter wavelength and the source impedance from this antenna is going to be more like 10 ohms in series with a small capacitance. Now if you compute the 17 microhenry inductors reactants over here on the left, I got J100. I think that was at 1 megahertz. And I look at this circuit and what I see now is an L match. I basically see an L matching network that converts from a 10 ohm source up to a 1k ohm source. We also know that that impedance transformation is associated with a voltage step up. So this is good because the signals are weak and we get a voltage step up even up to the primary of this transformer. Then we go through the transformer itself and that's associated with another voltage step up about 3.3. So the voltage at this point here is about 33 times the open circuit voltage. So even without transistors or tubes to amplify the signal, we've amplified the signal. One important note when I was analyzing this, I realized that this drawing I think has an error in it. I don't think we should use a 1k ohm headphone here. Originally these were done with high impedance crystal earphones, which are about 20k. And that's important because we're only at 11k level here. It's important to make sure you don't load it too much because if you do, the bandpass filtering will be destroyed. So that crystal radio has two primary limitations. One is you can only get a little bit of amplification. The other one is that it's not very frequency selective. To get more gain and more selectivity, of course, we need active devices. In the original days, that meant vacuum tubes. Now it's transistors. On the left, we have a configuration which is essentially the same as for the crystal radio. The difference is the position of the capacitor and the fact that here it's an explicit tuning capacitor as opposed to a feature of the short antenna. In any case, we get voltage step up from that. We also get some selectivity. The secondary also has bandpass filtering just as in the crystal radio. Then we go into a triode vacuum tube which amplifies the voltage from the grid to the plate. We have a higher AC voltage at the plate. And then we have an LC tank circuit which provides more bandpass filtering. So we get more selectivity. Then we go through another stage of the same thing. And finally we go through a DMOD and our headphones. Here's a slightly more modern design that works at somewhat higher frequencies and uses transistors instead of vacuum tubes. The antenna input is now standardized at something like 75 ohms. We have an attenuator here, but we'll assume that we're at maximum RF gain. And so the signal just goes into one of these transformers, depending on what band we're at. The secondaries are resonated with capacitors. The primary ones are here, and they're ganged with the tuning capacitor in the radio. Following that, the signal goes into a cascode amplifier composed of Q1 and Q3 here. Finally, that amplified and pre-selected signal where we've constrained the bandwidth some goes into a mixer, which is this transistor here. That converts down to a lower frequency and then the primary filtering is done at this lower frequency called the intermediate frequency. So many of you may recognize this as a super heterodyne receiver where we start with the RF, we amplify it some, we filter it some, and then we convert down to a lower frequency where we filter it more and then amplify it more. This is pretty common for many narrowband radios these days. Moving up in frequency somewhat higher, this is an example of a VHF-UHF radio. This one is also multiband. 
so the antenna can be switched to different circuits. Here, let me assume that the switch is moved to the FM position so that the antenna comes in to L1. L1 and C1 are clearly a series LC resonator or bandpass filter. And then L2 and this capacitor form a parallel bandpass filter. The combination of the series LC and the shunt LC form a two-pole bandpass filter, which gives it better selectivity. In addition, there is C3 here. That is a DC block for the biasing, but you'll notice that it's 20 picofarads. So I believe that's part of input matching to this common base amplifier. C3 is essentially the series arm of an L-type matching network. The inductor is folded into L2 and shared with the bandpass filter here. So you probably noticed that all of those examples so far are somewhat older designs that use discrete devices, vacuum tubes, BJT transistors, and junction field effect transistors, JFETs. This is a single chip radio from some research papers published in the early 2000s. The transceiver shares a single antenna shown here. And the trick is to do matching from the transmitter to the antenna and from the antenna into the receiver, while also protecting the receiver from the strong signal that the transmitter emits. So let's see how that's done, starting with the transmitter. The transmitter schematic is shown in the upper right here. So let's zoom in on it. What we can see is the signal comes in from the synthesizer and modulator on the left over here and goes through an inverter and then that turns on and off M3 and that sends current pulses down to here. This is essentially a class D amplifier. Those current pulses are converted to a sine wave at this node right here at the drain of M2. How does that happen? Well, transistor M1 here when you're in transmit mode is turned on. So think of the bottom of this capacitor C1 as grounded. That means it's in parallel with L1 forming an LC network. And so that is a bandpass filter that creates a nice sine wave here. Now this transmitter is intended to put out 100 milliwatts or plus 20 dBm. In order to do that on the supply voltage, which is around 3 volts, we need to generate the signal at a lower impedance level. In this case, M2 and the resonant circuit sees 20 ohms at this node because there is an L match right here. That L match then matches the 20 ohms up to 50 ohms or conversely that takes the 50 ohms and makes it look like 20 ohms to the transmitter output. That way we get enough power because power is V squared over R so we use a smaller R at this point to generate a higher V squared over R. That's the trick used in most high power transmitters. This is not high, but the same rules apply. Now let's switch to receive mode. So then we want all the signal that comes into the antenna here to get into the receiver circuits so we have maximum power transfer. We don't want any of the output of the transmitter loading that signal down. So let's take a look at this circuit again. When M1 is turned off in receive mode, that's what this labeling here means, what we have then is C1 doesn't exist. It's not grounded anymore. So think of it as not here. And the antenna is connected over here and sees a capacitor to ground. It sees L2. M2 is off. L1 is in series with L2, so it sees L2 and L1 in series in parallel with C2. So that's an LC tune circuit, and it's high impedance looking in here. So that's what achieves the goal of not having the transmitter load the received signal as it comes into the antenna and makes its way to the receiver. So now let's take a look at the input receiver circuits. Those are shown in the lower right. The antenna comes in, and if we're in receive mode, then 
this Rx minus means that there's a low voltage here that turns off this FET and this FET over here. So imagine this doesn't exist and C1 is not connected here. So the, the only thing we have is L1 and C2. What is that? Well, it's obviously a matching network that converts the 50 ohms up to a higher impedance driving into the amplifier. So it's just like what we talked about. Now, if you switch back to transmit mode, what happens? This TX is asserted, which grounds this C1. At the same time, M2 is grounded and shorts out the gate over here and shorts out C2. So this is ground here at the right-hand side of L1. And this is ground here at the bottom of C1. So you have L1 and C1 to ground in parallel. And what that does is it blocks the signal from coming in. This is a high impedance looking in here because it's a parallel LC resonant circuit. So we've applied everything we've been learning here in this episode, episode two, but also episode one. So this is some circuitry done in some research. Let's look at a commercial chip now. This is a popular chip from Texas Instruments, and I pulled the data sheet, and that's where all these pictures come from. I have annotated it some down here in the bottom that we're going to look at. Inside this chip, there is a low noise amp, so there's a receiver chain over here on the right-hand side. And there's also a transmitter and a power amplifier output. So the kind, same kind of stuff that we talked about. We don't know exactly what's going on inside this chip because we don't have a diagram of that. However, the manufacturer gives you information such as shown here. They give you a diagram of the circuits they would like you to add externally to connect the transmitter output and the receiver input to a common shared antenna. They also give you values of components that you can use at different frequencies. So at 315 megahertz, I use the values that are shown here in this table. Using those component values and the frequency, I've calculated the reactances of the various components. C1 is shown in the table as not used, and so this is J infinity. So C41 is effectively not here. However, this looks like a resonant circuit, and it still is because looking into the output of the power amplifier over here on the right, there's probably a fair amount of capacitance. And we can guess, based on the theory, that if L41 is a reactance of 44 ohms, that capacitance, looking back into this chip, is probably around 44 ohms also. That would create an LC resonant circuit. So we can look at this and understand kind of what's going on. It's just the capacitance is over here. Now, the transmitter in this case is intended to be 10 milliwatts at 3 volts. And what we want to do in that case is actually convert from 50 ohms at the antenna to a much higher impedance that the transmitter output sees. Because remember, it's V squared over R. So if we're only trying to get a small power, we may need R bigger. So looking out from the PA through this circuitry, and then what do we have? We have C42. Hmm, that could be an L match down to a lower... 50 ohms, but also there's C31 up here, and we don't know what goes on inside this chip when you're in transmit mode. I'm guessing that they have a MOSFET in here that shorts out this input, and therefore shorts out L32. If that's the case, then C31 right-hand side here becomes grounded. Now, if you take C31 and you kind of fold it down here and put it right here and make it grounded, you can see that it becomes a voltage divider with C42. So that's one of those tapped capacitor LC networks. And I did all of that, and I calculated that probably what they're doing is taking the 50 ohms and converting it up to 400 ohms using these reactances here. And that then would give you, assuming there's a 3-volt swing peak at the output of this node right here on transmit, that would give you 10 milliwatts. So I think that's what they're doing. So I know we covered that really fast. But I would again encourage you to pause this screen, 
and go back and look at some of the others and try to analyze these circuits yourself and understand them because that's the way we learn how to build our vocabulary of RF circuit design. So as a review, these are the topics that we've covered in this episode. In part one, we covered the first three topics, why use matching networks. We looked at the L matching network design, which is ubiquitous. We did it for the receiver input, but it's used everywhere as we've just seen. And we also looked at using nano VNA to validate our designs. In this part two, we covered the other matching networks and we looked at a bunch of examples for real world applications. And I, I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you've learned some. Going forward, these are some of the topics I hope to cover in future episodes. The next one will be on amplifiers. That'll be fun trying to cover like two semesters of stuff in one or two videos, but I think we can do that. Then we'll look at how to make local oscillators. Once you've done an RF amplifier, it's pretty easy to create an oscillator. So that's kind of neat. And then we'll look at mixers and IF amps and demodulators. These are all of the things that the students do in this course to generate a complete receiver design and build it and test it. And remember, you can do this now because of the existence of things like the Nano VNA and the Tiny SA. Some additional resources. American Radio Relay League, ARRL. They have a lot of material out on the web. You can just search for them. One thing I want to point out again is licensing. If you do any transmitters, you absolutely must have a license or know what you're doing or both. You do not want to interfere with people that are trying to use the radio spectrum themselves. In addition to that, some of the material that I've covered in these two episodes has been devoid of any deep math and it's been devoid of justifications and proofs of formulas that I've thrown at us. If you want to look at some of the math behind it to get a better, deeper understanding in that sense, this is the book that is used in the course. We don't follow it directly, but the chapters here map very closely to what we're covering. So this book is an excellent resource. Okay, well, again, thank you for watching, and I hope to be back with another video in maybe a couple of weeks or so. Please check back then, and or look at some of the other videos in the Nano VNA series and in this Radio Design 101 series.